And he said, what is it you want? He said, I was calling upon Father. He said, well, you want religion, I'll give it to you. And then in the temple ritual before the Godmaker movie, he would then go out and get a hireling of Satan, which would be a, be a Protestant minister to come in and teach them the orthodox faith that God is everywhere, that, that we're saved by the gift of Calvary, that they we're saved by grace and these kinds of things, and, that, and there they conspire to teach this evil stuff to mankind, the doctrine of orthodox Christianity, and we pointed that out so many times, so often, that they removed that from the Mormon temple ritual. But anyway, while they get this all worked out, and, and, and Adam decides he doesn't want this hireling of Satan to teach him the orthodox religion, he, he denies the orthodox religion, he runs off the minister where you have the whole story of Mormonism in a, in, a, in, a, in a little capsule, there you have the evidence that they have denied the Orthodox faith, and he turns and accepts Peter, James, and John coming down to teach him the secrets of Freemasonry, annotated, so that they can learn the signs and secrets. And so there we then, through the instruction of Peter, James, and John, we then learn the secret handshakes, and basically we, we swore blood oaths to... At that time, we learned these little handshakes, the secret handshake, the secret word, the secret sign, the secret penalty, and then we swore to have, if we violated this, we'd have our throat slit from ear to ear. Another one, we, we swore to have our belly ripped open and our bowels and our intestines spewn upon the ground. Uh, we, we did another one across our, uh, our chest, that, signifying having our chest ripped open and our heart ripped out, and a few other good types of things. See, and, and here... And here we have a doctrine of darkness where we're suddenly learning secret things that have no basis in, in, in Scripture. Jesus said, swear no oath at all, let your yes be yes and your no, no. Jesus said these things. And here we are doing these things in this temple ritual, an evil abomination. Well, we went through all these signs and ceremonies, and finally we ended up at this veil, and this great veil was no longer rent in the temple. It was back up. In the Mormon church, there is no rent veil. There is no opening to the Holy of Holies through Jesus Christ. It is there through your knowledge of the secret handshakes. And in my time, and I wrote about this in, in, in this book right here, it's called The Mormon Dilemma, about what some women would experience going up to this veil and doing what I'm going to describe to you. Because I would go up to the veil, and on the veil, sewn into the veil, were the same markings that were on the apron. And they're still there. And the markings are still on Satan's apron in the Mormon temple. They just took out a few of those other things. But right there, right there in the veil, was a square and the compass and the rule of Freemasonry again. The same things that were on my underwear. The same things that were on Lucifer's apron. They're on the holy veil of, holy, in the holy of holies in the Mormon temple. And there I would go, we would go in and we would immerse our arms up to the armpits and wrap our arms around the man portraying God on the other side of the, uh, the other side of the veil, and we would do the Masonic five points of fellowship, foot to foot and knee to knee and hand to back and mouth to ear, and we, instead of wishing, whispering Mahabone, which the Masons do, we would say health in the navel, marrow in the bones, strength in the loins and the sinews, power of the priesthood be upon me and upon my posterity through all generations of time and through all eternity. And we would go through the secret handshakes, you know, and then you'd say, what is wanted? Adam, having shown all the signs and done all the things, seeks to enter the celestial glory, celestial room, and they would open, come, enter, and you'd step in there. And then, it was only then when I saw my wife again. All the rest of the time, she was separated from me. Great wedding ceremony. Then we had powers and principalities Kingdoms and dominions sealed upon us in a sealing room, and then our children were sealed to us for all time and all eternity. You know, I got saved in 75, was speaking about Mormonism by the time it was 78 and 79 or 80. I was up in a little town called Fairbanks, Alaska, doing a seminar about this, and I was teaching about the Mormon temple ritual. And as I got to the part about, about health and the navel, marrow and the bones, strength and the loin, uh, power of the priesthood be upon me, I stopped. And I said, you know something? 
I have always thought that we're talking about the power of the Melchizedek priesthood would fall upon me in that, at that moment, at that time, in uttering those words. And I said, what priesthood did we talk about? And we're talking about the power. I'm up to my armpits in the emblems of Lucifer's power and priesthood. And I'm asking that power and the priesthood be upon me and upon my children and my children's children. I said, I believe, you know, as I was thinking, in the middle of this thing, I'm sort of stuttering, I think, I put a curse on my kids. And so I ran, I finished the meeting, scooted out to a phone, I called my wife, Carol, in Seattle, and I said, Carol, you won't believe what I just found out 45 minutes ago. And she said, you won't believe what happened to your children 45 minutes ago. I said, what are you talking about? She said, your two sons began to vomit and scream and flop around the floor, rolling around, slamming into the walls and everything else. She said, it was, I couldn't believe it. It was, it was insanity. And I said, what happened? She said, well, I just walked over and I said, Satan, you foul demon, you get your hands off my children in the name of Jesus Christ and get out of this house now. And they just went to sleep. And she said, they're sleeping right now. I left that night, went home. Got, I've got eight kids, which is another Mormon problem. <laughs> uh, uh, uh. I'm a contributor to overpopulation just in my house, you know. And now they're out procreating, you know. I mean, now with the grandkids and what have you, it's getting to be a, a zoo at Christmas time. And Thanksgiving time, is we don't have tables big enough. Well, I got back to my, well, my kids and I got all my kids together and just broke those curses. That I, I, I asked God to forgive me for the abomination of, of, of ritual, the satanic things that I've been involved in. I tell you what, every Mormon that's in the temple has gone through these same things. They've taken out the blood oaths. They don't have to swear it down. They don't have to stick their arms through the holes anymore. I don't know, they hold hands like this or what, but they, they've changed these things because they are so abominable. And when we tell Mormons about it, they say, yeah, we would never do that in the Mormon temple. You, you liar, you deceiver. You know, I told one guy, I said, he was in my office and he's telling me he's going into the temple that week. They got his own endowments, is what they call it. And I said, he said, you're a liar and a deceiver. He said, we would never do that. God would never ask us to do it. And I said, I'll tell you what. I said, when, they, when you stand up there with your little outfit on and you bring your thumb to your throat and bring it across your throat, you're going to hell. Just as you bring it across, you say, here I go off to hell. I'm gone to hell. Because you've just denied the God of your salvation. You've gone to another altar. You're serving this demon God of Mormonism, and you're going to the pit of hell for it. I didn't see the guy for a month and a half, and he came back to my office and I said, Well, he said, You were right. I said, What did you do? He said, I faked it. I hid my thumb. <laughs> okay. you know. And he got out of that place and never went back, praise God. You know, he found the real Jesus Christ. Stark things. And yet you see these people are beautiful people. They're not the enemy of God. They don't have a... They don't, they're, they're not out trying to do evil things. They're not out trying to, you know, be evil. They're not out trying to serve Satan. They have a heart for God. They love God. I don't know a Mormon that I've ministered to all the years that hasn't have a love for God, seek to serve God, want to do the best for God that they could do in their life, to do anything and everything they could. The Bible says in Isaiah 9, 16, that the leaders of them shall cause them to err, and those that are led them are destroyed. So they're evil teachers. Second Corinthians 11 you read that, and it says, it says that Paul was speaking. He said, I have a jealous heart over you, just like God had, that you not be misled. There are people who come and bring other Christ to you and other gospels and other spirits to you. Beware of those people. He said, because they're false teachers. They come as angels of light, whose ministers claiming to be apostles of God, faking it, claiming to be ministers of righteousness, but whose end shall be according to their evil works. I don't know any other scripture better than that. Galatians says, Paul says, But we, though an angel from heaven, or we come and give you any other gospel than that which we have given you. That person, that angel, even if it's an angel, is to be cursed. And again, in verse 9, he repeated, and he said, Again, I say to you, if anyone bring any other gospel than that which we have given you, he's to be accursed. 